Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Chinese and British, um, British Conversation. This is part two of the conversation. My name is Georgie, Georgie Mao, Ma Puyu. And I have a podcast, um, so I'm also known as Chinese Chippy Girl as well, for those that don't know. Um, this is really exciting to be back, because in November last year, we also had uh, the part one of the conversation. And it was really amazing, so I'm really happy that I've been invited back um, for part two. In November last year, the first conversation that we had, we had it with uh, writer and food journalist Angela Hoy. Is she here? There she is at the back there. Hi, Angela. Um, also, Be Seen, British East and Southeast Asian Network, Amy Fung at the front here, gives a wave. And also, the other panelist that we had was model, singer, and songwriter, and my sweetheart, uh, Jason Cran as well. Uh, hands up who went to the first conversation. Did anyone go? Yes, obviously you went. Yeah, amazing. <coughs> so it's really good that to be back for part two of the conversation. And to be honest with you, I genuinely feel that we need to have more of these conversations, not just with the British and Chinese community, but with the EC community, East and Southeast Asian community as well. Um, OK, bit of a question here. Who listened to my podcast? Hands up. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you, thank you. You'll all get a tenner at the end of this. So for those that don't know, I have a podcast called Chinese Chippy Girl, where my aim is to um, invite guests from East and Southeast Asian background and to talk about our experiences of um, being a, basically being an Asian minority in the UK. And I just think this is so important for us to have because genuinely, I think 10 years ago, there wasn't anything like this or that Maybe, maybe there was, but I wasn't looking for it. But I just feel now, I feel like really seeing that we're having all those conversations. There's an exhibition about being British and Chinese. And obviously with the Oscars as well, we completely dominated it. We dominated it, yes. So I think it's really important to have these conversations, whether it's speaking to someone, colleagues, in the, I don't know, in the cafe, in the cafe or something, having a conversation like this, or even at the Oscars where it's just so high profile, it's just amazing that our Asian voices are amplified and we're able to celebrate our culture. Today I have a new panel with me, uh, who I will introduce you to. I have um, writer and journalist Li Jia Zhang. I have founder of Frank Su Foundation, Alan Lau and I also have photographer and a brains behind eight story series, Jamie Lau as well, where the exhibition is just behind here on stage. Okay, so we're now going to spotlight Lee Jia. We can have... Hi, Lee Jia. Hi, Georgie. <laughs> okay. Lee Jia Zhang was born in Nanjing in China. At 16, she was taken out of school and worked in a military factory for 10 years that produced missiles. Um, her works include China Remembers Oral History, her memoir, Socialism is Great, which is a picture of her as well. And I think the books are available to buy at the end. Yeah, they're just there. They are the table. Oh, okay, just over there as well. I'll remind you all after this as well. And your works also include a novel, Lotus, <coughs> Li Jia appears regularly on TV, radio, and international media, such as South China Morning Post, The Guardian, and New York Times. Li Jia, do you want to tell us more about yourself? Thank you, Georgie, for your very kind introduction. So I, I will continue <laughs> to introduce myself. I'm the number two child of the, my family, never had too much attention, so I craving any kind of attention, <laughs> so thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I was a rocket factory worker turned writer, I guess probably don't need to meet one of those every day. <laughs> I grew up in the uh, residential compound um, of my mother's factory, and uh, all, my, all my friends, all, all my neighbors were factory workers, um, working for the same factory, and all my friends were the children of the of the workers. Becoming a factory worker was probably the most outcome, but uh, I had a grand plan. I want to be a writer and journalist, 
Um, I had this dream ever since I, um, my teacher started reading my writing as a good example to show other students and won writing competition. But uh, when I was 16, I was taken out of school and put to work at the factory, my mother's factory. Wow, that's crazy. And that was 1980, so you clever people can quickly work out how old I am precisely. Um, so the reason was very simple. We were very poor. And I think it's, uh, China now has changed so much. And uh, I think probably even for my children, it was very hard to imagine how poor we were, how poor China was. Um, so I'm a big foodie, partly because we didn't have good food to eat. Um, and in fact, I was often hungry, so I always have this craving for meat. It was a luxury. So on the hot summer days, my brother and I used to go out to catch cicadas and roast them over um, a bonfire and munch them up. If you haven't tried, I dare you. <laughs> I think the reason for um, my mother took me out of school was very simple. We were, you know, we were poor and also I think being um, uneducated, my mother never saw the benefit of education and uh, she thought the most important thing for a mother was to secure a job for her daughter, especially the factory my mother worked for and I worked for, was very prestigious. Among other products, it produced intercontinental missiles wow. that were capable of reaching North America. <laughs> and you were working um, in this factory? Yes, but no fear, no fear. I was no nuclear scientist. <laughs> I didn't know any top <laughs> nuclear scientist. I was, the job I was assigned to was uh, to test a pressure gauge. Very simple and repetitive. Um, and a, Worst of all, there were just lots of control, and the factory was very much a mini communist state and provided lots of things, workers, a dining halls, libraries, shower houses, hospitals, but also controlled our life. Um, you know, the, I, my life was just limited in the factory. I stayed in the, I lived in the, domi the factory's dormitory and I went to work, and after work I went to the shower house run by the factory. And um, every month all the female workers had to go to this hygiene room to show the so-called periods, please, of uh, blood, to show we were not pregnant. That is so crazy, because I have actually read a little bit, and we kind of spoke about this. Yes, please. This is... <clears throat> I know this is in your uh, memoir as well, but this is something when I was um, doing my research on you, oh, and you spoke you. about the period police, and I was like, what is a period police? And I read more about it, and so did they, re did they really have to check all the women to check if their periods came? Yes, because that's all, and then you go to show them and you'll get a bag of sanitary towel. That was in the name, was done in the name of looking after female workers' social welfare, but effectively part of the strict family planning control. That's so crazy. So, right, sorry, I have a, a billion questions about this. So, did you, was it something that, you would have to go to them when you were on your period? Or, yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. then I'll just yeah, give an example to show that, you know, um, how controlled our life was. So uh, anyway, I hated my life at the factory. Um, when I tell my international friends that I worked at a, a rocket factory for 10 years, people say, wow, that's so fascinating. But for me, that was just mind-numbing, so destroying experience. Um, so I, I, as an escape route, I decided to teach myself English. Um, so hopefully I could get a job as an interpreter with some of the Western factories that were slowly, uh, companies are slowly setting up shops in Nanjing. I mean, learning English, I mean, lots of Chinese people you meet today you speak excellent English. I mean, at that time in China, learning English was difficult. I had to borrow a radio from my cousin, mm -hmm. and I followed a program called New Concept English. It was a new concept indeed. I became fascinated with this language system so different from our Chinese characters. And, and so much so, I, you know, I've become really quite obsessed. <laughs> you know, I often find myself talking English 
to myself or sing carpenter songs, you know, the carpenters. Sing, Aww. sing a song. <laughs> I heard learning song was, uh, you know, sing English songs was a good way to learn mm. the language. Um, you know, probably you think that uh, carpenter was a bit naff, uncool, but for us, the carpenters represented the high culture from the West because uh, Carpenters was the first Western album that went on sale in China. So slowly, some of my colleagues um, look at me, you know, with wary eye and uh, earned myself a nickname. They called me um, a toad who dreams to eat swan's meat. Really? Meaning I was dreaming something possible. They said, you are, you know, a little factory worker. Why would you want to learn English? And you, you told me, you never, you will never be able to master language, and I just, and I just didn't care what other people thought about me. You know, uh, individualism has never been a strong part of our culture. We have lots of sayings, for example, you know, um, urging people do not stand out, do not, dif do not be different. You know, for example, you know, the birds who flies out first gets shot first. You know, pigs should be afraid of getting fat. So all these things just tell you to be not to be different, but slowly I didn't care because this concept of individualism took roots in me. After my English improved, I began to um, listen to BBC, which broadcast news very different from our Chinese propaganda. Mm. I become political with our friends. We're talking about politics all the time. You know, uh, what was the separation of the power? Would the democracy work? That, would that the answer to China? In, 19, in 1989, I organized the biggest um, protest among factory workers in support of the democratic movement led by students because I believed the individual could you make led, a difference. You led it? Yes. Oh my goodness. Wow, it's amazing. amazing. Yes, that was that 1989 was a nationwide m movement. So I actually substantially I have written a memoir about my experience working at uh, the missile factory. It's called Socialism is mm -hmm. Great. It's, it's nothing to do, it's, well, it's not about socialism, it's about, about me. <laughs> socialism is great, it's just a, a popular revolutionary song we used to sing. Um, by the way, I wrote the book in, in English. And I think if I had written that book in Chinese, I think the sex things would be less <laughs> explicit. <laughs> we'll talk about the um, relation with language a bit later. I think probably I overused my time. No, that's, you know what, I knew this was going to happen. I had actually more questions for Lija, but <laughs> we need to pass the mic on. Um, but you've got such an interesting background. I feel like when, I'm, when I've had this baby, when I get back into podcasting, I definitely need you to come on my show, but you can just talk more about it. Uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, Lija. <laughs> okay, up next, I have um, Alan Lau, football fanatic, founder and chair of Frank Su Foundation. Frank Su was the first person of Chinese heritage to play in the English football. There he is here, such a handsome boy. Um, Frank was raised in Liverpool to a Chinese father <clears throat> and English mother. Going back to Alan, sorry, also a handsome boy as well. Um, Alan has been involved in grassroots football for over 10 years, organizing events for the EC community. And also my cousin, Kevin, he's probably watching online. Hi, Kevin. Um, my cousin, Kevin, has met you before because he plays football and I think he's played at one of your events or one of your tournaments as well. So I have to give you a shout out because I know he's probably watching. Um, Alan, do you want to tell us more about yourself and how you founded Frank C. Foundation? Can I just Foundation? say what an amazing story and I feel really, really, how can I follow that up to be honest because <laughs> that's really hard to follow up. But, um, Thank you. I don't have any uh, period anecdotes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born just down the road from here, actually, uh, not far. Oh, you're a Londoner? I'm a Londoner, oh. but I moved out to Watford uh, when I was one. Uh, I grew up in Watford. Um, full disclosure, I'm a youngest child, so everything in the world is brilliant. Everyone is <coughs> me and everything, get, I get my way. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about that a bit later, yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so I grew up in Watford. Um, I'm also a uh, takeaway boy. Yes. <laughs> um, so helped out with my parents 
cooking and and uh, sitting out in the counter and taking orders. So yeah, I think there's a lot of lot of um, things we can talk about there uh, yeah. later too. And um, I think as a as a reflection about your story, Lija, is so for when I was growing up, um, I did go to Chinese school, but I hated it. Right, don't, don't tell my kids this because they won't hear it. I really hated it. I was I was the one who sat at the back and was like, don't don't want to be here. We are. Yeah. And I was I was doing that until I was about 13, 14, and I was still in like beginners class. And it was one of those things where I was like, I don't like this, I don't want to be here, but my my mum still made me do it. And in retrospect, that was really stupid. Because when I grew up, when after I finished university, um, I went to China to study. I went to Beijing to study Pu mm -hmm. uh, So I was there for six months. And I'm just thinking, why am I wasting all this money going all the way to learn here when I could have learned all this stuff as a kid? Um, so, yeah. And for me, when I was learning Chinese, uh, Pu Tonghua, is because, similar to you, well, in a sort of ref uh, a, a roundabout way is that for me, um, we had a, I work for my family business now and we import Chinese crafts. So I felt for me to take on the, the work that I was doing for my family, I had to go back and learn Chinese, I had to go back and learn Portonghua. So in the sort of like, I needed this to get my job, needed this to pursue my careers and dreams and so it's, it's, it's quite interesting hearing from your point of view from how you went to learn English and I'm learning Chinese and it's sort of crossed over. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I think I am contractually obliged to tell you about Frank Sue. Go for it. <laughs> um, so I've been working in the uh, Chinese community, doing a lot of community work for the last 15 years. After, after I went to um, study Chinese when I came back, um, one of the reasons why I went to China and when I went to Hong Kong was, you, you know, you did have that thing where you, you go to find yourself. You have that gap year and then you go to see, you know, what, what does it mean? And for someone who's grown up in England, <coughs> I've always felt displaced. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room with a similar sort of story where it's like, who am I? Why am I here? Or when you was growing up, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, am I Chinese? Or am I English? Why don't my English friends like me or invite me to parties? And why do all the English girls don't ask me out? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <Poor stuff. laughs> um, so it was one of those things where I went back. I'll tell you, I actually lived in Hong Kong for a bit first. And I took on the sort of expat -y sort of lifestyle where most of my friends were all international friends and we used to go out Lang Kui Fong drinking all that kind of stuff and that didn't felt right either that was like this is still not finding yourself and I felt when I went to China when I learned the language after I went to, to um, Beijing I backpacked through China for three months just on my own backpack just going around just talking to people and I think from that that's where I got my well that's when I realized most people are just the same. I'll be on a bus and just chatting to a random guy because like, for him, he was like, what the hell is this guy doing? What's this, what's this all about? Because I look like you, but I sure don't dress like you. Or I don't, why have you got such a big bag? He had a big bag, he, he, was, he was going to market. But um, it just starting these conversations and saying, actually, it didn't really matter who you were or where you're from. It's like, because when you keep on pulling at that thread, mm. you probably never find that answer. Mm. Um, and it took me that long to really figure it out. And I felt when I came back, when I started working with family business, I wanted to do stuff back for the community. And I did a lot of work with the youth club at the Chinese Community Centre. Um, so it was sort of giving back and showing them, like, it doesn't, it, for a lot of young people, te teenagers, it's, it's tough, right? You got hormones, you got, you know, and then it's even tougher when you've got this sort of who am I kind of mm. thing. So I wanted to do something to help them think, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Let's just, you know, find the things that you want to do, what you really like, and just work on that. Mm -hmm. Because if you try and go down that route of finding who you are, 
probably not going to find it. And it doesn't, you know, okay, for some people it does matter, and it, it does matter, but then it doesn't. So, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's a weird thing. So, anyway, that's Frank C. <laughs> um, I was doing things in the community center, and I created the um, football team for the London Giants community center. And I've been doing tournaments, leagues, um, mainly for the Chinese community, East Asian communities, and also like mixing with all other other communities. And I came across Frank's story uh, in 2016. So this book, I'm going to plug my book too. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, this book is by Susan Gardner. So without Susan, none of this for me, I, I wouldn't be here because. I'll tell you a bit, Frank. So, Frank played football in the 30s and 40s. As you said, uh, his mum was English and his dad was Chinese. Um, he played for Stoke. Uh, he captained Stoke uh, alongside Sir Stanley Matthews. I'm not sure if, if well, I'm trying to read the crowd. Is this a footballing crowd? Uh, <laughs> either. Sir Stanley Matthews is probably that equivalent of David Beckham. He's like top. At that time, everyone knew him, big name. And he was his captain. Right. So, so Frank was. So that Frank was Sir Stanley Matthews' right, okay. captain. Frank was Stanley, right. So he must have been good if he could be the person to. Of course. Yeah. Uh, he also played for Leicester. He played for Luton. Um, and the really, really mind blowing thing for me is that he he played for England, but because it was during the war, it wasn't an official cap. Uh, they, they, they were wartime caps. So he played for England nine times, and. I mean, growing up, I love, as you said, I'm a football fanatic. I love football. I always, you know, when I grew up, I was playing, you know, I wanted to recreate those times when I was Alan Shearer or Michael Owen. You, if, football people, you probably know how old I am if I'm, I'm quoting those people. But, um, what team do you support? I'm a Watford boy. Ah. I'll, I can tell you all about that later. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so to know that someone from my background, from my heritage, played for England, because it's like, I mean, I wasn't good enough, but I could have. Anyone could, right? Anyone, you know, someone, someone, from, because, you know, you, you, you've, you've had the same thing. That you, you know, your, your parents would tell you, be an accountant, be a lawyer, mm. you know, be a doctor, be those, all those me meaningful jobs, Me yeah. of course, but. Stable. What? Yeah, Sensible. very stable. <laughs> But yeah, footballers are right, you get a lot of money for that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. But do you know what I mean? It was it was never it was never a <clears throat> thing. You was never you know, he's like, son, put the ball away, go and read your books. So I think the one thing about Frank Sue is because I'm not a football I'm not massively into football. My partner watches quite a lot of football, probably a bit too much to be honest, but never mind. Never too much. <laughs> probably a bit too much. Anyway, we'll part of that conversation. But I'm really impressed with Frank Sue's background because I learned more um, about him through social media, through his Instagram page, but there's also um, a story about him downstairs at the British um, exhibition as well. Sorry, Chinese and British exhibition as well. So I think it's really good how you've basically uplifted um, a, a, Chinese, uh, a Chinese sportsman, a sportsman mm. with Chinese heritage. So thank you so much. Um, we will come back to you, but for now, a round of applause to Alan. I went to football just the other day for the first oh, time. Did you? Oh, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. That's, that's, that's music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to turn into a football chat now, isn't it? <laughs> OK, next um, on the panel at the end, I've got Jamie Lau, British photographer of Chinese, of Chinese heritage, interested in exploring cultural differences between his Chinese and English identity. Jamie has an exhibition behind this stage uh, called Eight Stories, which is a collection, so that showcases a collection of Chinese and British people forging their own identity within the countryside. Jamie, do you want to tell us more about yourself and more about the exhibition as well? I know there's a picture of Mark Nam here, which we will talk about later, but for now, we just want to talk about you. So if we're going to go back to roots, I'll, I'll just start from the beginning. <laughs> um, so I'm, so my, my dad's from Hong Kong. Um, my mum's actually Thai, so I'm, I'm part, half, half. But I kind of consider myself whole 
English. And the perspective for me is um, my parents split up quite early on in life, and I always had my Chinese side in London and my Thai and, and English stepfather in Bedfordshire. So everything for me was quite sort of disconnected in terms of Chinese heritage. And Chinese heritage for me, or Chinese, the Chinese experience for me was going to North London, going to Chinatown, having food. It was always around food. But then I'd dip back in and out, and that was pretty much it. So for me, growing up um, in, in, in Bedfordshire, as one of the only non-white people in, in the village, it was quite difficult to kind of maintain this sense of who I am, um, Am I Chinese? Am I English? Am I Thai? It was actually easier for me just to admit my Thai side because, in some ways, it was harder to explain to people that you have different kind of backgrounds and different kind of heritage and influences. It's better to say, I'm English. And I think for me that's quite interesting because I think a lot of people, possibly not even with a Chinese background, have to have these same battles, the same sense of identity <coughs> culture clashes. And for some reason, it's easier, at least for me, to, to dumb it down and just sort of say, this is who I am. But sometimes it doesn't always fit with actually who you should be in your heart. You kind of get along and, and you kind of muddle through life. And at the, uh, the age of 44 now, I'm sort of realizing maybe I'm not Chinese enough. <laughs> <laughs> my brother, I don't know if this is a Thai thing, um, but my brother, um, had more of an issue, I guess, moving into um, the, the village as a slightly older teenager. Um, and I don't know if it was his English friends or his Chinese friends, but he would be referred to as a banana. Is that a thing? Yeah. So like yellow on the outside, but like white on the inside. And I don't know how he took that. Um, probably, I'm not sure if he took offense to it, but it was just a, a, as it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting, like, um, I think the only other person of colour in my school at the time was, was an Indian girl. And some of my friends, they, weren't, they, weren't, they are my friends now, but some of my fr sort of acquaintances thought we were brother and sister. So it was kind of confusing and, <laughs> well, confusing for them anyway. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in digging down to these big kind of cultural possibly misunderstandings between English and between Chinese. And um, in, in a way, I'm, I am from a sort of a unique kind of uh, environment, although I know other people from my project um, have kind of similar sort of backgrounds. And I was just interested in um, basically researching, first of all, who can I find <laughs> who is, has a Chinese heritage and has some sort of um, kind of like background within like the countryside or identifies as being both based um, within rural areas or, or, or kind of has that as part of their identity and being Chinese and, and how does it sort of overlap? Um, and Mark Nam <laughs> was one of the, the people that I found. Um, and just, I'll, I'll come on to him in, in a second, but um, I think for me, just the way of kind of dealing with this sort of multi-dimensional kind of identity was to kind of, kind of not really bury my head in the sand, but just sort of to get along with it and, and not really be sort of visible and be as sort of vocal in my own way, but not sort of shout, I'm, I'm Chinese. And obviously there's, there's racism there. Um, I'm not going to make a big thing of it because I think that's just a part and parcel of who we are and, and, and what we need to deal with. I know for a fact um, Mark, who's behind me, is very vocal, and I think he, um, he campaigns for sort of stop Asian hate and is very kind of like in the community and, and tries to sort of be a part of the community that he's in. He's um, just a little bit of background behind him. He's the first English vicar that's been ordained into the Church of England. So he's very much kind of like, he hasn't hit a wall, but he's, he's in this sort of pioneering sort of stage where he's the first person of 
of that or of our heritage um, to, to be in that sort of situation. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if it is, but I think he has probably come across possibly more to protest against, possibly because he is sort of breaking through and, and, and doing what he does and ad advocating for, for um, uh, yeah, to stop sort of Asian hate. Whereas I'm sort of like below the radar a little bit. I have sort of um, blinkers a little bit. When people say stuff, I, it just sort of goes over my head and I kind of keep my head down. So it's, it, it's a different dynamic. But for my series, um, eight stories, I was interested in finding basically people who, um, who I, I knew for a fact that there was no sort of generic story that you could say, this is what someone who lives in the countryside and is Chinese, this is what they do, because there's, there's no such thing. And actually, I found it quite hard to, to sort of maneuver through that process. Um, but everyone in, in, in the project has some sort of relevance to my own story in terms of where I'm from and, and the things that I've done in, in, in my life. So just to also explain the title, eight stories, there's seven portraits, <laughs> physical portraits, but I'm, I'm the eighth um, story. Um, the idea behind it is that um, the actual physical stories, the written text, the actual verbal stories um, that I want to kind of get over um, this evening and, and on the text on the walls is just as important. Um, I didn't want my project to be just about the visual. Um, even though it's very important to kind of place Chinese faces within the countryside, to some people that's quite a jarring kind of um, image. Um, that's on one level, but more importantly, I wanted to dig down and, and really sort of investigate everyone's experiences just to show that there's a breadth and there's no, mm -hmm. no, um, no homogenous kind of one way to, 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 to tell. Just also, just to sort of round that, that off, I think it's, I think if you were to summarize who the people are that I'm interested in, it's the fact that Chinese communities are, are, are obviously quite kind of like dense in bigger cities, London, Liverpool, Manchester. There's not really much of that in, in, in the sleepy villages, in, in the home counties. Um, and I just wanted to sort of give people a, a bit of exposure, a bit of a voice, and, and just to sort of explore what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but we can talk about that a bit more. It's quite interesting because I <clears throat> can relate to some of the stories in your um, the eight stories. So growing up in Macclesfield, I think we spoke about it in uh, the part one conversation where Amy was born and bred in London, so her experiences was different to maybe like mine and Angela's, who's also part of um, eight stories as well, because we grew up in... Um, you know, in, in, a rural, in a rural town. And I completely agree with you. Like, we were the only uh, Chinese family, I felt, in Macclesfield. And it's not like, it, was, it, was, it wasn't like a tiny town. It was quite big, but we were, like, the only people that looked like us. I think there was a few, a couple of Chinese takeaways. Um, I think my dad tried to say hi to them, but I think they were just like, oh, you know, you're a competitor. But, we, but the kids went to different schools, so we were, like, the only Chinese kids you know, in that school. So, so I think it's really interesting what you've done. And I felt like, um, and you're completely right, because each portrait that you focused on, they each had like a different, uh, different story. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's really good. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I just want to just follow up what yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Jamie is saying about the who I, you know, we're talking about a personal identity. And I, would, I, I think I'm, I, I like to think I'm, you know, Chinese writer, write, even though I write English. A few years ago, I went to a literature festival in Hong Kong, and I was introduced as a, a British writer, and I immediately protested. I said, hey. no, I'm Chinese. <laughs> um, even though I hold British passport, I don't think one's identity is defined by the, you know, by the passport. Mm -hmm. And um, um, anyway, I think my... Um, Sensibility is more Chinese than British, but then again, I think um, the culture identity is really—it's a very fluid thing. Yeah. I don't think I'm typical Chinese. I don't think I'm typical British, and I think the culture is—I always feel like a culture. It feels like a sea we are s we're swimming in, and you're not always conscious to where you know which sea we are swimming in. And I think uh, the, uh, you know, the identities, the, your personal identity is also very fluid. I remember the Palestinian, renowned Palestinian poet, 
and called Mohammed uh, was um, Wawish. He wrote a poem and to pay tribute to um, Edward Said. He said, I have two languages, but I have long forgotten in which language are dreaming. Oh. <laughs> so, um, just go back to the eight stories. So if anyone wants to go and visit the eight stories, it's actually behind here. Um, is there anything else that you want to add, add at all? I think we'll come on to it in the language yep, we'll um, yeah. part of this okay. conversation. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, so now I want to focus on the Chinese and British exhibition that's downstairs. And it's on until the 23rd of April. For anyone watching online, um, thank you for tuning in. I think there's a, a section at the bottom of the video where you can ask questions. So we're going to have some Q&As at the end of this as well. So anyone in the audience here and anyone online, you can feel free to ask um, any one of us a question. Um, but just going back to um, the Chinese and British exhibition, I think it's absolutely amazing. I know we've said it like a billion times already, but I think it's so amazing that there's actually an exhibition just about, about our community. Is there anything from the exhibition that's really stuck out to any of you? I'm just absolutely delighted there's such an exhibition. And I know, um, I think UK has the oldest um, Chinese community in the whole Europe. And I think there are, I don't know, I think of probably um, just slightly under 1% of the population are Chinese. Yeah. But uh, you don't hear the of voices so often. Their political presentation is very limited. Um, I think, uh, yeah, just, um, you know, I think probably Chinese and like many Asians like to tend to live their life quietly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I think uh, it's great that this exhibition recognizes the Chinese community, recognizes the contribution. And I know people, wonderful people, like my friend, good friend Mi Ling, who is the, f the first uh, Chinese labor councillor, and they've done great things. And, <coughs> yeah, and my daughter, she wrote uh, um, her dissertation on the Chinese, com Chinese community in Britain. So oh, well wow. done, Kirsty. Um, so yeah, so I'm just delighted there is um, such an exhibition at all. Yeah. What about you? I'm, I'm again contractually obliged to talk about Frank Sue. <laughs> 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 no, I think it's it's amazing to have have this platform. Yeah. Because there hasn't been anything like this before, and even though we're, I think it was not not point. I checked this morning. It's not point seven percent. Or, or yeah, no, not point seven percent. No, that's that's uh, that's the last sensor. It's last the same. It's not changed. Really? Yeah. It's is it? Oh, so I what is it? Not point point seven percent of the UK population are Chinese. Uh, on on I thought the form. Twenty eleven. That was twenty eleven yeah, figure. Uh, recently, when they they released a new one a few months ago, the new figures. The Chinese. How about those people not registered? Well, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the thing, no, the other thing about yeah. that. How about students? Yeah. Because it just says Chinese, but it doesn't have things like Malaysian or uh, Vietnamese or right, okay. others. Or you know, it's, it's yeah. very hard yeah. to yeah. Yeah. to judge what our community yeah. is. But roughly about one. Yeah. Yeah. One. So, I think it's. A, anyway. I think that's uh, been quoted often. Been quoted yeah. as about one percent. Yeah. And I think. The other thing is, as you're rightly saying, that it's one of the longest, um, was well, the oldest one in Europe, and there is a lot of history there. There is a lot of, I mean, I'm second generation, but there are some people who, especially in the Liverpool area, who are third, fourth, fifth generation, mm. who've been there for a long, long time, and there's so many of these stories that hasn't been told. Mm. I mean, of course, Frank Sue's story hasn't been told, yeah. so. But, <laughs> but I know what you're saying, though, because I think a lot of um, the Chinese people that, that migrated to the UK, I think a lot of them came to, to Liverpool first. Mm, yes. Uh, like, like my dad, my mum and dad both came, and, and my, my grand... Actually, both my grandparents came to... Mm. I think they, 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 they arrived in Liverpool first. Um, I think it was, it was a major stopping point before America. So a lot of people thought they were going to America and then they just ended up in Liverpool. Oh, really? Yeah, that's one of the things. And then it's, there are, as I said, there's so many stories, um, sad stories, mm -hmm. like for example, um, the, 
the um, Lufthansa. Oh, the seafarers. Yes, the oh, seafarers. Oh, I know. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. But then also positive stories about Frank Sue and about, <laughs> and about no, just other, like you said, that there are other positive people out there that I didn't know existed. And for, for someone growing up, being in, doing all this stuff in the community, it's like wow, that's that's really that's really important. That's mm. really good to have someone that we can pull on, mm. that we can say that, yeah, we're like them. This is something that you know that that resonates with 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 us. In um, in the 1930s to 1950s, a, a group of Chinese artists and writers lived in Hampstead Heath, and one of them, and Jiang Yi, uh, wrote a serious book called Silent Travelers. Oh, really? Because he, yeah. many of them did, couldn't communicate, yes. didn't speak English. But uh, they, they did wonderful things. By that time, uh, the Chinese generally had quite negative uh, connotation after yeah. books like uh, Dr. Fu Manchu, this evil guy, clever, evil guy, yeah. exotic guy. Um, but as though they introduced Chinese culture and also, um, you know, they tried to kind of uh, really present a, a more positive image of, of, uh, of Chinese people. It's interesting you say that too, because <clears throat> I feel from a Chinese background, the Chinese heritage, we want to stay under the radar. And that's one of the things that why it's pushed everyone around. Mm. Like we, we spread out, not, not congregating, not, not sticking our heads out. So having one of this in London and then having the other ones that are around the country yeah. too, it's, 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 I hope it brings us all together <clears throat> and it brings us all to really, you know, just talk about talk, like having these conversations, talk about what we've done, what we've achieved yeah. and how we can do even better things in the future. Yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting, this is the most simple kind of observation, but when I walked into the show and just saw the title Chinese and British, I kind of thought, well, that's obvious, right? But then actually it's kind of, it's, it's, not, it's not out there. No. It's not kind of like blazoned to say, this is, a, this is a group of people who have this identity. And I kind of thought, actually, the, the title's so simple because it, it just says what it is. And, and in a way, I kind of, I got kind of emotional when I walked through for the first time because I didn't think I needed it, but I kind of do need it. It sort of massages your soul a little bit yeah. to know that, that we're on that kind of platform, which is it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think for me, what really stuck out was, well, the, the, the one thing that kind of touches home the most is the, the model of the, of the Chinese takeaway, because obviously with my... Uh, Chinese takeaway background, but there's so much more that I learned, like the, the the seafarers, like the men that had moved to the UK and then got married uh, to women, and then they got tricked and then they got deported back to um, back to Hong Kong, and they never got the chance to say goodbye to their to their wives or their families, and that really that really upset me. But then there's other things that I've learned, like I think there's a, a video video downstairs that talks that sh is, is filmed in a in a, in a Chinese restaurant but it focuses on uh, on a girl that's mixed race and this is something which I really want to learn because obviously uh, I have a four-year-old who's mixed race have another one on the way as well so it's just something that I really want to like learn more about so for me it's quite fascinating just to to learn more about that and then there's the other thing because I'm a really big tennis fan the Emma Raducanu <laughs> like I just want my daughter to play tennis so badly I want her to be the next Emma Raducanu and I'm having another girl as well so I'm hoping that they'll be like the next William sisters or something but anyway that's just me um, but yes, the exhibition is on until um, 23rd of April. Um, the exhibition is also available in other cities as well, which I've actually just discovered. Um, I think there's the Chinese and British exhibition in Aberdeen. My nephew's there. I think he's watching. Hi, Chung Chung. And there's one in Edinburgh Library as well. There's one in Manchester. So there's quite a few. So if any of you don't live in London, it's not just here. It's, probably, it's in uh, different uh, cities as well. Okay, for the next bit, I need to take my jacket off for this one because I feel that like this is going to be like therapy. So I want to talk about languages. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be like therapy, so I need to take everything off, okay? So I want to talk about languages because I think each one of us, we all have a story. We all have our own personal journey or had a personal journey about languages, whether it's... Um, 
being born in China and learning English for better opportunity, um, being, going, being forced to go to Chinese school when we absolutely <coughs> hated it, I did anyway, I, I agree with you there. Or maybe, um, Jamie, you know, you grew up in um, your mother's Thai and your father's Chinese. I'm just going to make the assumption that <coughs> you spoke, Sorry. that you spoke English at yeah, home. Yeah. Can we just talk about this? Because I think this is something that's really important, uh, particularly um, for people with dual nationalities that have that are bilingual and multilingual. Um, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I, um, I made a, I, earlier I talked about how, I, I find it really fascinating how um, um, the language shapes our language or even personality. Yeah. And I made, um, quite a few years ago, I made an important decision in writing, um, in writing English. I only started to teach myself English when I was 22 and a half, probably. In some ways, my English will be never perfect. Um, but anyway, um, I write, um, I make a living now from writing and I write in English. The reason for that was that um, it freed me politically. Um, I arrived in England in 1990, and one year later, I was asked by a Chinese publisher to write a book uh, about the Western image of Chairman Mao, which I found very interesting. So I spent like, many... Write it in English or write it in Chinese? In Chinese. In Chinese, in Chinese. Okay. Yeah, for the Chinese. For the 1993, was Chairman Mao's 100 years anniversary. But anyway, so I wrote the book. I spent many hours at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, and I interviewed many people from different walks of life when I finished the book. But uh, in China, you have to go through the censorship. The book didn't pass the censorship, so... Uh, it didn't not, pass the yeah, censorship. censorship? because uh, some people described Chairman Mao as a butcher, for example. That was just not possible. <laughs> Um, so, um, I, ever since then, I made a decision I'm going to write in English. Okay. So I can, don't have to, I'd, I'll be free from censorship. And also, I found it really interesting that uh, I writing, I found a sense of freedom in writing in a language. It's not my mother tongue. Because it's not my, 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 not my mother tongue, I can afford to have an adventure. And I could experiment using different verbs, using different uh, different sentence structure, and I borrow Chinese sayings in the Chinese, such a wonderful language. So, yeah, so... Um, did you, did you self-taught yourself? Because you, I think you said early in your introduction that you borrowed some tapes. Did you have, <coughs> did you have anyone teaching you, or was, was this all done just... No, I, 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 yes, I followed the radio program. Later on, I signed up an uh, English course, like, like um, called Teach Yourself University. It's kind of a equivalent of open university. You sign up course. So I signed up a course to study English so that I can study it um, systematically. Um, yeah. um, but I think it's also quite interesting that uh, uh, I think you, when you speak different language, it can bring up different personality. Um, I, when I speak Chinese, I realize I speak quite fast, <laughs> very loudly. <laughs> when I speak English, I try to pretend I'm a bit more cultured. And <laughs> because I was always very conscious that uh, um, I tried to imitate the proper BBC English. Because I was always very conscious I wasn't very cult, um, I, wasn't, I, w I didn't get a great education. Um, just um, um, last month, I, I ran a book group. We, we had a book of discussion, and we were, um, we were having dinner at the Chinese restaurant, and it was very loud, people talking very loudly. I kind of instantly switched to that Chinese mode. So towards the end, I just got up and shouted at the waiter. I said, Shrek, give me a leg of bao He was like a Shrek, it was kind of, a, you know, like a handsome boy, I need a, a box for takeaway. <laughs> but I just cannot imagine I would shout like this <laughs> in a, in a, in a, yeah. in a um, you know, normal, uh, or British restaurant, or let alone French restaurant, where you, can, you cannot even <laughs> say grab, you can, can engage the waiter with your eyes, you know. You can never, in China, would just say, oi, where's our food? Yeah. Actually, in Cantonese, it's like that as well. It's like, but you, wouldn't, you would never go into like, 
you know, like a British restaurant, go, pretty girl, pretty handsome boy, come here, please. Mainly, mainly. Yes, yes. Unless I've had a few um, was, it, was it quite common when you were in China for other people to learn English? Like, was, it, was it quite popular or was it common for them to, to also learn English because they wanted an opportunity? Or was it just, was it just you or was it just not very, um, or not as common? Um, I, I think that the, in the 80s, uh, before, we were talking about during the Cultural Revolution yeah. or before, learning English language would get into trouble, even landed in prison. So that oh, was, really? uh, yeah. So, so in the 80s, then China opened up and, uh, um, you know, economic reform started. So people, uh, China needs talent. So there's yeah. um, lots of people starting to learn the language. Yeah. And I, I guess I didn't do too badly yeah. because I've got thick skin. I, I'm willing to, <laughs> always willing to talk. And even though I, might, I spoke so loudly, you know, as if the sheer volume could compensate the lack of uh, fluency. Anyway, so I think that's the way yeah. to learn. You just have to open your mouth and, and talk. I feel like we've come from like totally different uh, perspectives because I grew up being forced to speak Cantonese to my parents. Um, but I really, really hated speaking Cantonese. And I hated when they speak, speak Cantonese to me in front of my friends. I was like, oh my God. And they'd call me Puyi, which is my Chinese name. And I was like, stop calling me Puyi. My name is Georgie. Stop calling me. Because I, just, I was just so embarrassed that my friends would like laugh at me. But now it's obviously it's all very different. Did you have the same as well when you were growing up? I think for me, it was a weird, because I didn't like Chinese school, mainly because I just didn't like learning. Did you not like it? <laughs> did, you, did you used to go on a Sunday? Yeah, yeah. Was it like torture? Because, because you go to school on Monday to Friday. The, the, the worst thing is that because I, I didn't bother, I'll get put back in class. So by the time I was like 12, 13, I was with all the like six year olds. And that made me even oh, worse. So I'm like, oh, I can't talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then that doesn't mean that I didn't, I speak Cantonese generally quite fluently. I speak Hakka my family are Hakka. Do you speak Hakka as yeah. well? No, uh, I don't. And then I, sp uh, I learned Poutonghua. But I, I don't think I'm a linguist. If you ask me when I went to, <laughs> when I went to, uh, to Italy recently on a, on a holiday, um, it was only at the end when my wife told me, you've been saying like, uh, gra grazie. And it's like, <laughs> Spanish. Like, oh, crap. <laughs> I've been saying that all week. <laughs> but, but I feel that because, um, so I feel that I've, I do connect with my Chinese side and I feel that all those three languages, I don't really feel, it's not that hard to interchange the three. Once you figure it out, oh, actually, if you swap this word for this word, they're actually quite similar mm -hmm. and like the grammar's all the same. And <coughs> I think the other thing, like different to how you learnt when I was in Beijing, probably didn't learn that much in the classroom is mainly like you'll be surprised how much you learn when you're in a taxi or when you're having a massage because <laughs> <laughs> you're there for an hour you got to chat to someone so it's those are the places where you actually learn how to communicate yeah. Yeah. So it's not just language it's not the mechanics of immersion that's it that's exactly it um, and then like flipping it around so I've got kids and we we tried well, we try to talk uh, Hakka to them. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and they're at my parents a lot, so they speak Hakka to them. But they're, so when we had the first one, it was a bit easier, because you only got one. So I'm not trying to scare you, Don't but when you, get, yeah, when, you have the one, <laughs> when you have the second one, everything goes out the window, and you just need to do what you have to do, yeah. right? So again, I'm not trying to scare you, but it's, <laughs> So by that time, we, you know, you're, I'm talking more English to them and they're more comfortable talking English. Um, to extent, I feel the younger one, he'll, I'll say, we'll say something to him in, in, in Chinese and then he'll go, oh, what, what's that in normal? And then a little bit of me what's dies. What's that in normal? Yeah, oh, no. A little bit of me dies inside. But that's fine. That's just, <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll grow out of it. But then it's, yeah, I think the old... It's hard for us to, to try and give our kids this thing, but yeah. it is important. 
Yeah. It really is important. And, you know, as much I try as hard as I can and I hope like the rest of the family, we get together and try as hard as we can because even though, yeah, communication and language is all part of where culture and where you come from, because mm-hmm. it all stems mm-hmm. from the same sort of place, right? You, you talk about something and that's, that's how you see something. That's how you yeah. manifest ideas, right? So we try our best. As I say, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I mean, to be honest, it's quite funny because when I was growing up, when I see my contemporaries who were Chinese but couldn't speak Chinese, I'm like, oh, you must be really lazy. Mm-hmm. But, then, <laughs> but then I'm thinking, nah, now I'm thinking, no, nah, actually, it's, there's more to it. Yeah. There's more to it than, you know. Did you feel, because I know you, went, you, you were in Hong Kong quite recently, do you yep. feel confident going, speaking Cantonese in Hong Kong? Because I'm confident, but... I get it all wrong. I think there's one time we went to a, a, a Dai Pa Dong, it's that outdoor um, kind of restaurant. And then uh, the auntie, she was speaking Cantonese to me really loud and I was trying my hardest to keep up, but I didn't want to ask her to like, you know, and I asked her to slow down and she did, but she's really like, oh, she's really stroppy. And in the end I went, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But then the food came out and it's wrong. And I was like, oh no. But I, I feel now that I'm confident in my, not confident, like I'm, like, I, like I'm able just to like go with it, and I know you it's wanna, not perfect. Do you know the secret? When you're in Hong Kong and you want to get service, speak English. <laughs> <laughs> right? Go into the bank. Like, Master's language. Yeah, yeah. You call, you call them up, whatever, and it's like press one for for Tonghua, press two yeah, for Cantonese, yeah, yeah. press three for for English. If you press two or one, it'd be. Why? <laughs> don't <laughs> kind of thing. But if you talk in English, it's different. I mean, it is, it's one of those yes. things. Um, is it right? Is it wrong? No, it's wrong. Mm. But, <laughs> you but, but then I think a lot of them, a lot, when I was in Hong Kong, um, I think they get it more now too, that, oh, actually, no, they're foreign. Yeah. And I, I had plenty of friends who were like Korean or Japanese who didn't speak any Cantonese. So, you know, it's don't, don't take it personally because there are, I mean, Hong Kong's a very interesting <coughs> city. So, you know, there is, yeah, you don't have to just get away. But I mean, going back to your original question, I feel quite confident speaking in, in Cantonese because I do it for my work and stuff. So I oh, think, okay. yeah, but I, I would like to give that to my kids too. Mm. And even if they didn't, at least try. At least give it a go because yeah. it's, it doesn't cost anything to try. Absolutely. How about you, Jamie? Well, I can't speak Chinese and it's, it's a problem because I don't think I can really connect um, as, as well as, well, at all really with my family. That's a big thing um, in, in Hong Kong. Um, I usually have to go through someone in my family who can speak English to translate. Of course, there's like the, the, the friendly auntie who just talks at me. And even though she knows I can't speak Chinese, she just talks anyway. <laughs> but it, at the same time, it sort of like makes me feel included. It's like, fine, you're talking to me. You know, th- th- this is just, this is great. And inevitably, we communicate with food mm-hmm. as, as you do. Um, my little half sisters went to Chinese school Sunday, every Sunday. They can speak Cantonese. And going to Hong Kong, they translate for me, which is kind of a bit, bit strange, but, but it happens. Um, but then I think, I think for me, I have this sort of comfort in just not actually understanding what people are saying to me. I think in some, for some people it might be a bit disconcerting being in a room and people are talking and you don't understand what they're saying. But I've normalised it. I kind of like try and read what they're looking at or their expressions or hand gestures. Just take it, strip it back to base level. Try and communicate in any way you can. Um, I can remember from an early age kind of like being in a situation where like we've been singing in church and I'll try and sing, I just make it up, just to feel as though I'm... Singing in, singing in Chinese? Yeah, just, just to feel as though like I'm, I'm part of the experience, but it doesn't really matter that I can't say what I need to say or understand, but you kind of find your own way of communicating. 
but yeah, it's, 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 it's tricky. And, um, was it tricky for you as you were growing up? And, and also, was it tricky for you when you were maybe with other Chinese cousins or friends who spoke Cantonese, but you didn't? Was it, was it ever? I mean, it's tricky because as a kid, you kind of, you can connect, you can connect with, with sport, you can connect with computer games. But in the end, kids hang about w with each other when they can communicate better and you kind of splinter off and it's tricky. I mean, I, I've, got, um, I've got two kids now and I see there being kind of little reason for them to learn Chinese if I haven't learned mm -hmm. it. And that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a tricky one to... To, to sort of like get your head round. Yeah. Would, would you encourage it though? Would you? I would, yeah. I mean, actually, I, I, when I was younger, um, I was saying to my dad and my step mum, oh, like, maybe I should learn Cantonese. And they were going, don't learn Cantonese, learn Mandarin, because yeah. it's like the, 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 the business language. You're, yeah. you're useful. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, that's not the point. No, I want to learn it, to, in it in order to connect kind of thing. Mm. I definitely encourage it, but I just haven't, you know, it's, it seems like I need to learn it first. Yeah, but maybe I, I don't. I feel extremely lucky, and I'm looking back, and learning English has changed my life, you know. Um, what I learned was not just ABC, but the whole cultural package, and I really opened, I opened my mind and broadened my horizon. And I think many, many of us here probably are by culture, mm -hmm. and we are really the lucky ones, because uh, um, inevitably, our, you know, our life will be you know, always in, enriched and to various degree by, you know, by two cultures. I almost feel yeah. sorry for people who don't have it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why, how, how, how good is it to be able to see more than one side of the story? Yeah. yeah. Right, because yes, that's, yeah. that's what it's all about, yeah, right? And also, you probably have, have a better understanding. Well, many people just think, you know, um, in, a, in a kind of a one culture, one language, you think their, their way is a normal way. Mm -hmm. but if you have a you know, you know, bilingual or you trilingual... You start to question yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and we tend to be more creative, I like to think. <laughs> Actually, so, so just coming back to um, your, the language you use in restaurants. Yeah. I, <laughs> A couple of times, my little sisters have said, like my, my stepmom's on the phone at work, yeah. and she's shouting, yeah. really shouting. Yeah. They've had to say, don't worry, she's not angry. That's just her talking Sweet. normally yeah. <laughs> to clients. <laughs> so true. What are your, um, and maybe to the audience as well, what are your thoughts on the language of food, like how it's presented to you? We have to talk about this. You know how, like, like my parents, we spoke about this in the last panel as well. My parents don't say the love word or anything, yeah. but they show me love through food. And absolutely, I think that is yes, such absolutely. a big thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, is, is that something that you could all relate to as well? Yes, absolutely. My grandmother would never say, I love you and sing so. Or they would never say sorry say, either. Yes, so, yeah. I don't say thank you either. Yeah, thank you. Don't say sorry. Don't say I love you. I'm like, come on. Like, oh, yeah, but here's your favorite meal. Cook, I'm like, cook food. Cook food. That's yeah. the that's, uh, language expressed by, you know, f food is a way to express your love, really, yeah. very much so, yeah. Um, okay, I think we might uh, go on to some uh, Q&As now. So we'll start off with a, a few online ones. Um, we've got uh, Jean Lin, thank you for your question here. Um, Jean Lin has said, growing up as a Chinese American, we had inspirational writers to help us form our dual identities and learn about our heritage. Maxine Hong Kingston, Amy Tan, Lisa C. What books did you have by Chinese British writers to help you out growing up. Um, so also just a small reminder for people um, tuning in online, you can feel free to add <coughs> a question. I think there's a question box below the video, mm. I think, I've been told. So yes, anyway, do you Maxine only Maxine Hong Kingston, she's, she's amazing. She, I really loved her book called The Women Warrior. Okay. Uh, it's a kind of a, a family story but, uh, but uh, not uh, using her imagination, so it is great. And I honestly believe she paved the way for the success of Emmy Tan. Oh, really? Absolutely, because uh, when she, Maxine Hong Kingston published a book in the, in the 50s, 
and which was did reasonably well. But uh, at that time, the publisher was thinking, oh, a, a memoir for a Chinese woman. Um, but anyway, so I think that her book um, is just magical and uh, paved the way for the success of uh, Emmy Town. Um, do we have any Chinese British writers that helped us out growing up? Um, I think for me, I didn't really grow up reading lots of books. Um, and when I did grow up, when I was a kid, there was, not, there was no books out there that had characters that looked like us. There was like all these Roald Dahl books, um, How to Kill a Mockingbird, um, but there was nothing, there was nothing like, it's only now because I've got um, a little girl that I'm starting to get um, more, more books to read, to read to her, like, you know, Maisie Chan um, and Joanna Ho, just to, because they, the books that they've written, um, the characters are based on, on EC characters. So they're the kind of books that, um, that I can kind of like, you know, that I, that I read um, to my daughter. I don't know if you guys have anything. I'm, I'm going to also show how unscholarly I am in like, the biggest library in, in the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got one library book. as well. Yeah, I've got one book, yeah. <laughs> but, and I think it's because there wasn't any. No. Well, in my, in my eyes, there wasn't, I mean, I read comic books. I like reading like Marvel comics and all that. And there, there was limited, <laughs> there, was, there was some, but then nothing really resonated with me. There was nothing there to, mm. to really grab hold of. And which I, I think now is brilliant that there are people out there doing it. How we can talk, we can show our kids, you know, this uh, books, mm -hmm. how to get them to fall in love with books, how to, you know, so, no, I just think it's wonderful now that there is this new wave of, 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 of people doing this, and not just in books, not just in, in, in that, but more you know, just in general, because as we were saying, how it's so important having this here today, I feel we are starting, this is a wave that we're all, all riding. Um, riding. Yeah, no, yeah. that's it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what else. I mean, as a kid, like, I think, like you said, I, you know, Macbeth, Shakespeare, all, all these things, I like, just, I didn't really know of any um, sort of Charlie Pickers. <coughs> I did pick up Wild Swans and try to read it, yeah. but it wasn't really my kind of book. And so, just as a kid, it, I, I just wasn't really exposed to anything mm. along those lines, so sadly, no. Yeah. I've read Wild Swans, that's a, that's a really good book. Um, yeah, one of the most successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've done a, a play about Wild Swans, haven't they? I think Katie Leung, I think she was one of... I think she's one of the characters, I think. I think it's quite a while ago. Anyway, sidetracking now. Um, next question is from Mayan from BC. And hi, Mayan. Um, she's put, I love what Lee Jia said about having different personalities in different languages. I think Asian diaspora often have these multiple personalities and we can code switch intellectually. Do any of you feel like these multiple personalities are a positive influence or even a superpower? And if so, how? That's quite a hard question. I love what Lee Jia said about having different personalities in different languages. I think Asian diaspora often have these multiple personalities and we can code switch in, interculturally. Do any of you feel like these multiple personalities are, are a positive influence or even a superpower? And if so, how? Who wants to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I am. That's quite heavy, though. It's quite heavy, isn't it? <laughs> it's just when it go, go silence. Um, I, guess, I mean, I guess I know where you're coming from, how, yeah. because we were saying how different languages, and we're coming from different cultures, and we could flip from each thing. Mm. But on my part, I feel like the work that I'm doing with Frank C Foundation and the stuff that I'm doing from, from the community work, I try and be genuine and then let that be the message. And the flipping is just the way you <coughs> present it. So yeah. I don't know, I mean. I mean, you're you, it's like you're, you've still got your own agenda. You're, you're one person. You might be able to see different sides linguistically mm. or approach people in different ways, speak English or Chinese, depending mm. on the best result needed. But you're still one person. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can, I don't, don't know if it is, flipping in, in that you're able to flip personality. You are one person anyway, but it's just how you get 
get there is, is, is different. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Um, I, well, I think a Chinese, for example, compared to um, um, Chinese with British people, Chinese people tend to be more straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. And I, when I first arrived um, in England, my ex-husband was studying at Oxford. And I realized that, um, you know, I realized I didn't know how to argue, at least not in the way I often kind of said, no, you're wrong. I know. Only later I, I realized they will say, yes, I know, appreciate your point, mm -hmm. I know, you know, but in my views, this is this. Mm -hmm. um, and all, yeah, it's all, uh, yeah, I think it's been really interesting. Like my um, ex mother in law, somebody I really adored, I mean, she, she, in some many ways, she she was very British and very polite, and 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 you know, probably, you know, if I even she was just always very polite, a very being for her being charming. You know, this is more important than being truthful. If I probably if I give her a toilet paper, she will say, "Oh, how absolutely delightful!" You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me. It is quite, I need to think about it more, Mayan. But I think for me, one of the um, because, like, I think when when some Chinese people look at me, they probably assume that I don't speak uh, Chinese. Um, and I know this because I hear them talking about me in Hong Kong when I'm sat on the tube. So I think my superpower to this um, to this question is that I know what they're saying about me, and. <laughs> And I think also the like when we went to Hong Kong, I bought um, my partner Ewan came with, with us, and uh, we had um, uh, our, our four-year-old as well. And it's the first time she's been to Hong Kong. Um, our, our daughter's mixed race, and um, she she has blonde hair, dark blonde hair, but she has Asian features. And honestly, everyone was talking about her in Cantonese as if like, I didn't understand. And I was like, I know what you're talking about. I'm just like, like, I'm actually looking at them. I'm like, do you know that I understand? Or are you just saying it anyway? Because I think in Hong Kong, there's, um, there's maybe like little diversity, especially in Kowloon, where, where we were. So she was just this, um, I don't know, she was just like this, this, this child with like blonde hair, but then they look at me, they look at you and like, oh, wow, wow, look at this, look at this. So um, anyway, I think that's fine. Do you feel that's move. something that, flip it around, people here might think that, but don't say it in, in Western culture? But Chinese yeah. certainly, oh, well, Chinese, you know, Chinese do think, Chinese people um, do tend to kind of making comments about people's, Appearance, appearance yeah. kind of really bluntly. Yeah, they do. <laughs> You're fat. Look at that fat child there. <laughs> um, okay, so those are the questions. Uh, those are the online questions. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? Yes, is there a microphone as well? Um, <coughs> the lady, oh, oh yeah. We'll, we'll come back to you. Hi, um, I am also second generation, was also the child who really hated being in Chinese school as a kid. And now I also have a young child. And so I'm wondering if you have any tips at, to sending young children to Chinese school, how you, can you get them to actually enjoy the process? You're looking oh, at me. I'm not, <laughs> you know what, I'm not at that stage, I'm not at that stage yet. Um, I, did, I did let slip. So kids to, go to Chinese school now? Yeah, well the older one did, I did let slip to them that I didn't like it as much. Did you tell them? Oh, no, it, it came oh. off in, but here's the thing, here's the thing. But you're different because you're smarter than daddy. <laughs> <laughs> loves it, loves it. You had to be sugar-coated. Yeah, of course, because they're kids, right? That's, <laughs> that's how you, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> obviously as a parent, you want to encourage, but you can't really push. So, I mean, like, when, I'll, let me just tell you a bit about when we met, when I'm back to Hong Kong. So, during COVID, I was showing the kids, like, oh, this is what Hong Kong looks like. This is, like, these are videos about, and, and then I think you just slowly build into their mind. I mean, like, we're parents. We get first dibs on this, right? We, we should be the ones who should be nurturing them. So, you know, it's, it's a... I've made an effort to show them, oh, this is what it looks like, and then we'll talk about it, we'll read those books that we were talking about earlier. And then when I went there, I was so pleased that they, they got it. 
and you expose them to things. And you're like, okay, let's go and have gay dance. Let's go yeah. and eat this. Let's go and try this. Let's go and. And I think that's how how I feel as a parent. That's that's what I would that I'm doing to really encourage it. Because you know, you're not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to make them do what my parents did to me because it's a waste of money for one. <laughs> and then secondly, you know, what if what if they didn't go back like I did? What if they've just it just cuts it out and they they hate it? So I feel it's just, you know, try as much as you to encourage all the things around it and then hopefully they will they'll go. So Yeah. What if they don't what if they don't like what if they don't like it? Would you would you would you stop them from going or would you still still push them? I mean we haven't got to that point yet. So maybe if you ask me later, I'll maybe change my mind. But I mean it's just I think each one is a different situation too, really. Uh, I, you know, I'm actually, I'm teaching Chinese uh, in the Chinese community in Hastings, south of London. And I'm also teaching English online to Chinese students. And I, I've been teaching English, Chinese also in America. I had uh, experiences. And, to, uh, and so uh, I find, you know, there's a theory about 1,000 hours. So if you uh, emerge in a language for 1,000 hours, then you will be uh, quite fluent. So say if a kid goes to a Chinese school on weekends, only one hour or two, two hours, then uh, it will be 100 hours a year, because there are 52 weeks a whole year. So if you do the math, it's going to take 10 years for them to finish that 1,000 hours. Uh, so actually, <laughs> apart from that two hours in school on weekends, if a kid can, uh, sorry, I'm going, can, spend, uh, can uh, study at home for an hour every day, so that will shorten the whole process to three years. So one hour a day, mm. uh, roughly 300 hours a year. So three years will be 1,000 hours. So what can they study for this one hour at home? Uh, right now we can use a very good tool. It's, uh, there are many good apps in China, you know, um, more than several so far I know. There's one called Wukong Shi Zi. Wukong, you know, we know Sun Wukong, Monkey King, Monkey King, in the journey to the West in that story. Yeah. It, was, it is an amazing app, and you can download onto your uh, iPad and your phone. The three-year course is only 30 pounds, roughly 30 pounds. Then you can just use, and then it's very interactive. My daughter has started uh, about a year ago, she started, and now she's learned more than 100 characters. Oh, really? Well, yes, only many by herself. And uh, I tried very, because she's also mixed race. At home, I tried to speak. Chinese to her, but in the past uh, six years, um, only myself, you know, that's very not, in, not enough. Because you know, mixed race, they, they play with other kids, speak English at school, English at home. When I spoke to my husband, we speak English. Yeah, yeah. so uh, not <coughs> enough. But in the past month, she played with that uh, app, and then she, under she started to understand Wukong and Shifu. And she asked me why she cried two days ago because uh, uh, Shifu. Uh, drove away Wukong because Wukong killed uh, that Bai Gu Jing, you know, oh, that ghost demon, woman. Yes. Yeah, the evil woman, uh, disguised as a beautiful, uh, kind woman. But Wukong has the uh, Huo Yan Jing Jing, like uh, shiny eyes, sharp eyes. He can tell, oh, that's a ghost. So he uh, killed the ghost. And then Shifu got very angry, so drove him away. So my daughter cried for two days. Oh. Yeah, he wouldn't go, go on. I was, oh, it's all right. And then later she asked me, why didn't uh, Wukong stay in the Hua Guo Shan, the mountain, flower and fruit mountain, to enjoy his uh, freedom, uh, happy life with other monkeys? Uh, why does he want to follow Shifu? <laughs> I said, oh, that's a very good and uh, deep question. So I, yeah, I said, Shifu... The monkey wanted the adventure. Yeah, I said, Shifu saved him, so he's returning the, the goodness. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think that it's a good way of learning Chinese. So you need, if you have this, uh, create this environment for the kids and using the modern app. Yeah, What's it so called many. again? It's called Wukong Shi Zi. Wukong is the name of the monkey king. Wukong Shi Zi means to uh, learn, to recognize the character. Wukong, W. Yeah, W U K O N G. Shi is S H I. Zi is Z I. Wukong Shi Zi. Oh, nice. App. Yeah, that's the Chinese uh, four characters, which with HD, I think, in the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good yes, to you. Did you write that down? Sorry? 
Sorry, I was oh, asking okay. my daughter to write that down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think the lady in the white jacket is here. Oh, sorry, sorry, after. Oh, oh well, do, well, sorry. Angela, Angela first. Angela, you go first. And <coughs> um, sorry, we'll do it with, with you after. now. Okay. Yep. Um, hi. So you're all very respected in your own fields and you're all parents. I don't know if, Lydia, you're a parent as well. But I would love to know what one piece of advice you would give to your kids or the next generation of like Asian diaspora or, you know, kids coming in from like China or Hong Kong. Like what one advice would you give them? <laughs> Only one. Just one. Only one. Just one. I, th I think for me, definitely speak up about anything. Doesn't have to be about race. Just like speak up because I think for me, I just didn't grow up in that environment. I was just like, keep your heads down. And even when I used to come home crying because some kid at school called me the C word, my mum and dad were like, oh, they're in the wrong, just keep your heads down. And then that's how I just got on with life. And then like 40 years later, I now have like massive childhood trauma. But I just feel like if that happened to my child, I'd want her to like, uh, to, to speak up. Um, but not speaking up just on her, but if she sees anything happening with her group of friends, I'd want her to like call things out. Um, and I think that's a journey which I'm trying to, to do as well. I find it, because I talk about it in my podcast, it's quite easy to talk about it, but when it comes to practice, I don't, sometimes I freeze when I see something wrong, but that's, some, that's that part of my journey, just because it's quite a new thing for me. Um, so yeah, I definitely want Sadie and, and um, whichever, whatever her name will be, uh, to, like, to like speak up on things. I, 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 I think of the older generation of Chinese, the, for, for them it's very important just to build a shirt, kind of a, keep your heads down, yeah. do your things. If something happens, just put up with it, just forget about yeah. it. For example, one of the reasons, um, in one of my friends, Chinese, and she was um, marked, she was um, robbed in Paris. I mean, in, in Paris, lots of the criminal gangs targeting Chinese because uh, they tend to be quite rich. And also, um, when something happens, they don't follow up. They just just drop it. Mm -hmm. um, that or just yeah. So just um, I think the I, I do think that the younger gen, the new generation of the Chinese um, in in the UK will be probably more. Um, assertive. I mean, can I just take this opportunity talking about uh, racism? Yep. You know, the, um, you all know during the pandemic there has been um, the, you know, lots of Chinese Asians and Chinese being attacked. I think that's again, that's an, if it happened to other race, probably people more likely to protest or make a fuss and because of the Chinese community, many people just, I don't know enough, I don't mm -hmm. think enough has been done. Um, having said that, uh, there, there will be a protest um, this Saturday, so um, you can Google it and find it online. Oh, but I, yes, uh, but I, I think the pandemic definitely unleashed um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the fear, the, the, the cost, the return of the fear of the yellow peril. Yeah. I don't know, um, I, I wrote a piece um, about, opinion piece about this. Um, I think the, in many ways this the fear of the yellow peril has never gone away because pandemic could just unleash that. And, and also, I don't know how many people realize the colonial connotation of the term yellow peril. In the end of the 19th century, the German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm, he had a dream. He dreamed the Buddha riding a dragon threatening to invade Europe. So he felt that the, the so-called civilized world, meaning Anglo-Saxon empires will be overrun, will be ruled, overruled by yellow-skinned Asian, mostly Chinese and Japanese. So that was one of the reasons mm -hmm. drove him to conquer China, conquer China and colonize China. Mm -hmm. um, um, just due to timing, I think we've really got time for one more question, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I really want to say my respect and how much I like Li Jiajiang because I think your story thank is you. very, yeah, you have a very adventurous and amazing life journey from a missile factory oh, to you, a, 
journalist and a writer to know, I think your life is very inspi inspiring for all the girls Thank and the women, really. And I'm uh, really interested in your journey, your story. So I, I was very looking forward to Georgia's podcast. You have to have an interview with <laughs> Lee Georgia. I will follow you that. <laughs> and uh, uh, my question is that, uh, um, like you were in, you were born, I think you were being like 60s or 70s in. I was born 1964. Yeah, so um, I think that is a very um, special time in China, and uh, it, it is not very easy for people in that era to like to go overseas. I think I want to know what drove you to to learn English and to protest to to go out to see the world. And uh, have you ever met any difficulty things in in this journey? Yeah, and. Uh, Another question is for about the cultural identity. Like, uh, um, like I feel that many people, like for British born Chinese, are very struggling with the identity recognition. But actually, from my my experience, I was born and raised in mainland China. Every time I I see people like you, I I can barely relate to to people in mainland China because I feel you are more like uh, Western people, British people. Mm -hmm. But so. I think why why are you struggling with this kind of uh, cultural identity recognition? You you can learn Chinese, you can learn Spanish, you can learn French. Mm. You you just learn language. Just take it a skill. You don't have to be a Chinese to learn Chinese. I think so. What's the reason behind this? Is that because of your parents? Your grandparents are too nostalgic. <laughs> they want you to must they force you to have this kind of uh, cultural identity. So have you ever think about the reason behind this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it has been a very long, slow journey to get where I am now. I tried this, I tried that. For example, when I was in the factory, I tried to take um, exams to try to become an interpreter. And even I did very well, I didn't have a connection. So I have lots of setbacks. And if you want, I'll be more than happy to share that with you afterwards. And the second question. So. And the second question, I think you're talking I about didn't, the... I didn't, it's for me, that's not particularly a struggle. And I feel lucky that uh, and I have, my life has been enriched by, you know, English language and the English culture. Um, I think we can, we can probably just quickly talk about the, um, the bicultural identity because we've um, really got a, like literally like less than a minute left. I think for me, I... Um, I've, I've never really embraced my Chinese culture, my Chinese identity, until like, I started my podcast, and it's ridiculous. Um, I think I, it's only, oh, actually, maybe when I became a mum, because I really wanted my daughter, Sadie, to learn more about her Chinese heritage. Um, and I think that's basically you know, my journey of trying to embrace it more. I think definitely when I was growing up, I did not want to be Chinese at all. I did not want to be Chinese at all. Just wanted to be. Uh, just want to be I, I just like wanted, else, I just wanted yeah. to be a white person, basically. <clears throat> so, um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to everyone joining us online as well. We've come to the end of the show. I also wanted to thank British Library for hosting the Chinese and British exhibition. Um, I think this is amazing, and it's on until the 23rd of April. So, if you haven't seen it, then definitely check it out. Um, thank you to the panelists, Lija. Alan and Jamie. Um, thank you, Georgie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me back as well. I'm really happy that my waters didn't break because I was really nervous <laughs> about that. And that's come to the end of the show. Thank you so much. I know a few of you had questions and stuff, but we've just run out of time. Thank you so much for um, coming, everyone. Thanks. Did you also mention? Oh, yeah. And if, there's, um, if you want copies of um, Socialism is Great book, um, it is available. So I can't see where it is. It's just they're going to set up. In oh, they're going to set it up. So cool. Can I say one more thing? Go on then. Um, oh, sorry. We, I forgot. we are doing a. So for the Frank C Foundation, we are doing a. We want to recreate some sort of exhibition um, to focus on East and Southeast Asian footballers or sports people, and we're doing a survey at the moment. So QR code. There's a QR code. If you could do the sur if you click on that, we have a survey. Do you want to um, pass it here? I hold it. Okay. I've. I'm going. Oh. We did a. I had a quick look, and on the survey there was a bit which was asking about um, oh, you're, 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 what sorry, sort of sorry. way people want to see. 
uh, more information about um, people from a East and Southeast Asian backgrounds in sport, and one of them was podcasting. So, I mean, do you know anyone who does a really good podcast? No, no idea. <laughs> it comes to the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you have any final words as well? So, I completely forgot about that. Um, I, only that on, on my own project, I, I'm basically it was quite tricky to get the people involved in my project just because it was kind of like early days. But I'm really interested to hear about anyone else's experience if you identify with being British, Chinese, and having any kind of rural kind of either upbringing or kind of background. I'm, I'm sort of interested in carrying my project on, even if it's just on a research um, uh, way of doing things. Since, since the show started, I have had people come to me and say, I'm Chinese and British. I come from Bedfordshire as well, which is just creepy because yeah. I didn't know that, that that was a thing. But yeah, I, I, I want to keep, keep sort of like finding people with similar sort of backgrounds and having more of a conversation because I think it needs to be talked about more. Cool. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Okay.